invite you to turn in your own Bibles or the few Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Easter morning. 
do you bring your love? That's what the women were really bringing. They were bringing expressions of their love. We only get out of worship as much as we bring to worship. We only get out of our relationship with Christ what we bring to that relationship. Second, on Easter morning the women found something at the tomb. Verse 2. It says that they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. On Easter, they found the stone rolled away. In other words, they found something they did not expect. They expected to find a sealed tomb with a dead body. Instead, they found an open tomb with no body. Now, what do you expect to find here on Easter morning? Now, if you are accustomed to coming to church on Easter Sunday, you probably expected to see a few more people than normal in church. You probably expected to see these Easter lilies, other flowers decorating the sanctuary. The, the scent of Easter lilies uh, mingled with the scent of Easter breakfast, the bacon and the eggs and the pancakes coming up from downstairs, the breakfast we had. Um, Maybe you expected that on Easter, or on Easter morning, uh, I expect certain smells. Easter Easter's associated with certain smells with me when I come to church. So I was not disappointed this morning. Easter would not be an Easter if I didn't smell these things. I also expect on Easter morning to wake up early while it's still dark, and go outside and preach in the cold as the sun rises. That's what happened. If you are sensitive to the uh, colors of the, uh, of the Christian year, liturgically, then you expected to see the white pyramids today, rather than the purple ones that we've had throughout Lent. You also expected to hear some hallelujahs. You know, traditionally during Lent, you don't hear the hallelujahs, but on Easter morning, we sing hallelujah. And I always choose that we sing, Christ the Lord is risen today. I would, it would be Easter for me. We can start off the service with that hymn. But again, I want to talk spiritually now. What did you expect to find here spiritually when you came here on this Easter morning? Just Easter songs and another sermon on the resurrection? Or do you expect to meet the risen Christ here? For the risen Christ said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. He said, when two or three of you are gathered in my name, there I am in your midst. When you came in these doors, did you expect to meet Christ in spirit today? Third, on Easter morning, the women saw something, and they heard something. They saw angels, and they heard them speak. Actually, the story says they saw two men in shining garments. It says that the women were afraid and bowed to the ground, and the angel spoke to them and said, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. In other words, they had a spiritual experience or religious experience. Now, I am a believer in spiritual experiences. I understand that there are varieties of religious experiences. William James was said. William James was the famous Harvard psychologist and philosopher who wrote a famous book by that name. In fact, he lived in Shakara during the summer. He actually died there. Uh, in the summer house in the summer of 1910. I was looking for the house. I was trying to tell me where the house was, James' house was. I'm not sure I found it. You have to point it out again to me, okay? So there are varieties of religious experiences. People can have some pretty strange religious experiences, which confirm to them all sorts of strange religious ideas. So I do not accept all religious experiences uncritically, but I also think that spiritual experience is essential to the spiritual life. From my point of view, it is important to have a spiritual experience of Christ because Christianity is not just about believing certain ideas about Christ. Now, doctrines are important, but they're not most important. Most important is the spiritual awareness of the risen Christ. When we read the scriptures about Easter, that is what comes through. These women at the empty tomb would later have a spiritual encounter with Christ. The disciples were to have experiences of the risen Christ. Even after Jesus no longer physically appeared to people, 
the Spirit of Christ had an ongoing relationship with his followers and those who lived after that time, right up to the present time. The core of the Christian gospel is a spiritual encounter and an ongoing relationship with God through his Son. Fourth, on Easter morning the women remembered something. The angel said to them, in verse 6, Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And it says they remembered his word. They remembered something vital on Easter morning. I hope you remember something this Easter morning. I hope it's not that you suddenly remember you left a burner on the stove going, or something like that. You know, I hate it when I'm going on a trip, and I've already gone out a little while, and I suddenly remember that I left you know, the door unlocked or open to open or, you know, the cat at home, you know, something, you know, some, something like that. I'm talking about remembering what these women remembered. They remembered the words of Jesus. I hope this morning, this service, you, you, this service will bring to mind memories of Christ and his word. Some people are raised in the church, but in time forget the church. Actually, as I've been reading of the changes in our society these last decades, fewer and fewer people are raised in the church. There have been studies shown, shown that fewer of each successive generations of Americans are being raised in a religious tradition. It used to be a time when nearly everyone had a religious upbringing. That was certainly true of my parents' generation, which was the World War II generation known as the greatest generation. But my generation, the baby boomers, left the church in the 1960s and the 1970s. Consequently, most of their children were not raised in the church. And even those who were raised in the church, many left the church when they came of age. The pull of our non-religious culture has caused many to reject their upbringing. And then their children, the grandchildren of the baby boom was even less likely to have a religious upbringing. The sad thing that is that when there is no religious instruction in childhood, there is nothing to remember later in life about Christ. So I hope that most of you here have something to remember. I hope that you, like the women in our story, can remember stories of Jesus, the words of Jesus, you know, it's easy to forget and to ignore the spiritual dimension. There are so many other things that we can occupy ourselves with. So many other things to do on Sundays rather than worship. And we are so busy. People are so busy. Our society also seems to me to be prejudiced against religious activity and religious belief. But you are here today because you remember how important the spiritual dimension of life is. You did not want to ignore that on this important spiritual day. So I, I encourage you to nurture those memories, not just today, but always, encouraging your soul, the spiritual impulse. When we take the time to remember, our lives can open up to a whole new dimension of the of God. Fifth, on Easter morning, the women told something to us. Verse 9 says, Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. These women followers of Jesus were the first proclaimers of the Easter message. Before the apostles even believed that Jesus had risen from the dead, these women were telling people about it. And they did not dis were not discouraged when the disciples did not believe them. It says, their words seemed to them like idle tales and they did not believe them. It's a modern translation, like the New International Version, the New Living Translation, say the words sounded like nonsense. Now, we are in the same situation as these women today. Our words about Christ often sound like nonsense 
to many people. As a preacher of the gospel, I am treated like these women are treated. Many people think that I speak religious nonsense when I talk about the resurrection. They look at me like I'm some strange creature from outer space. Well, I get this a lot at wedding receptions and funeral receptions. Because these are the settings where there are a lot of non-religious people who find themselves at a religious service. And then they go to the reception afterwards and they get to talk to the strange creature called the Reverend. <laughs> and they can inquire about things they were wondering about in a kind of a private way, in an informal way. And these gatherings are actually wonderful opportunities for me to talk about spiritual things to people who would never talk to me about this in any other setting. They are curious about me the way that an anthropologist is curious about the superstitions of some newly discovered tribe in the Amazon. They view my beliefs as remnants of a bygone age, as pre-scientific myths and legends that no one these days in their right mind would believe anymore. And it's fun to show them that I am not an alien, that I actually have a brain with critical thinking capability that the Christian religion is not anti-reason or anti-science, and that I'm not a fundamentalist, nor do I burn Qurans, nor do I go around knocking on doors like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, but I do tell people that I believe in Christ. As Christians, it's important for us, every once in a while at least, to tell people what we believe. They are not going to get accurate information any other way. They are certainly not going to get it from the popular media. In fact, it is more important that you tell people what you believe than it is that I tell them. Because they expect it from me. They figure I'm paid to do it. But you are not paid to do it. You have an opportunity that I will never have simply because of the titles in front of my name and the office and my ordination. People might actually take you seriously. They might think nonsense, just like the disciples thought the woman's story was nonsense, but maybe not. In any case, it's important, I think, for our own sense of integrity and Christian identity to let some people know, on occasion, what we believe. You know, every once in a while, turn some conversation that we're having with family or friends or neighbors around the spiritual issues. Talk openly, honestly, naturally, humbly about our faith. You know, not, not imposing our beliefs, you know, imposing our morality on people. That's the stereotype that people have of Christians. I'm constantly fighting religious stereotypes, it seems. I've never seen a believable characterization of a clergy member in any TV show, or movie, or even novel, as far as I can remember. They're all stereotypes. You know, Hollywood has no idea what to make of ordinary Christians or ordinary pastors. That's why it's important that we break the stereotypes by letting people know that we are ordinary people with an extraordinary story. Sixth and lastly, on Easter morning, a new spiritual reality began. And that's what we are celebrating today. On that first Easter, the women told the disciples that Jesus had risen from, their dead, and from the dead. And the first reaction was that this was crazy talk, but that was not the final opinion. Here in Luke's account, Peter got thinking about what the women said. And after he had gone, he, he went to look for himself. It says in verse 12, Peter arose, ran to the tomb. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. This visit to the empty tomb was just the beginning of the story for him. Soon the risen Christ would appear to disciple after disciple. In Luke's Gospel that we're looking at this morning, right after this account is the famous story of the two disciples walking on the Emmaus Road, and encountering Christ traveling incognito. 
And then we're told that Jesus appeared to Simon Peter, then he appeared to all 11 of the disciples. Each of the four Gospels that we have in the New Testament will tell different resurrection stories. They'll even tell the same resurrection stories somewhat differently. But they'll all agree that Jesus had risen and had appeared to the women and the men followers of Jesus, both in Judea and in Galilee. These resurrection accounts were the beginning. Christianity did not end with the resurrection appearances when Jesus disappeared from the site for the final time, 40 days after Easter. From that moment on, Jesus' presence with his followers was no longer physical, but it was spiritual. For Jesus has said he would be with us always, even to the end of the age. Christ is still alive, still with his people, still here today. He sang a hymn at the sunrise service this morning that says, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. And it ends up saying, he walks with me and he talks with me a long life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. This is the rest of the story. The Easter story does not end in the first century with these characters in robes and sandals. It continues today. We are just as much disciples of Christ as those first disciples were. We know Jesus just as much as they did. You know, I used to think I would have loved to live in that time and place and to see the earthly, physical, living Jesus with my own eyes. You know, if only I had had a time machine. You know? Go back to the first century Palestine. Be an eyewitness to the teachings of Christ, to the miracles of Christ, and the crucifixion of Christ, maybe even the resurrection of Christ. You know, I could have hidden out near the garden tomb and seen the events of the Easter morning unfold with my own eyes. Wouldn't that have been something? That's what I used to think. But now, I know that is unnecessary because he lives today. And it's even better today because he lives in us. The spiritual presence of Christ is in many ways more powerful than his physical presence was 2,000 years ago. And this is available to us now. On this Easter morning, we also meet and we know the risen Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this great event, this resurrection of Jesus, we thank you that it happened, that it actually happened 2,000 years ago. We can celebrate that. But Lord, we're even more grateful that we can experience that today. That the resurrection of the physical body of Jesus is not the whole story, but the, but the spiritual presence of Jesus here with us, around us, in our midst, in us. That is the real story of Easter. Lord, we pray that we might be always aware of your living presence. We might be able to communicate that in any way possible in our lives, in our words, in our deeds, in, in this community, in this church. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.